good day or good evening, whatever applies to you. Welcome to the 12th episode in the series. Here we will examine the evidence for the great flood of Noah's day and compare it to the Genesis record. I'm Dick Fisher, with me is my co-host Ken Miller. We saw in previous episodes that the judgment of the flood was upon Adam's generations. They were accountable. Under the influence of the nearby Sumerians, the covenant race, the Adamic race, became corrupt. God's grace could no longer keep them from judgment. The sword of the Spirit came by the way of a purifying flood. According to Jewish historian Josephus, who lived in the first century, violence and wickedness was prevalent in the days preceding the flood. Genesis records that the thoughts of, her, of their hearts was only evil continually. This is what Genesis 6, 11 through 13 has to say. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. We should know by now that the flood was local to southern Mesopotamia. It terminated the sinful Adamite race and brought death to the domesticated animals with them, plus whatever wild animals that may have been living in the Euphrates Basin at the time. So Genesis 6, 11, 13 is an excellent passage of Scripture to examine. However, just reading the verse in English as translated could cause one to believe that the flood was more extensive than that. The easiest correction to make is changing earth to land, understanding that the Hebrew word aretz does double duty. And it can carry either meaning depending on the context. The next accommodation involves the term all flesh, used twice in these verses. Here we have to do a little sleuthing. The ancient Hebrews didn't leave us a Hebrew grammar book where we could just look up Hebrew terminology. We have to study scripture to determine the rules. Genesis 2, 23-24 helps us define the word flesh. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. So the flesh that is to be destroyed is human flesh. The word all in this Genesis 6.13 is defined by usage. Genesis 41 relates to the account of Joseph, who was called by Pharaoh to interpret his dreams. Joseph told Pharaoh seven lean years in Egypt would follow seven years of plenty. Then Joseph was set up as overseer and directed that some of the corn growing during the plentiful years would be set aside to cover the lean years. We read in Genesis 41:48. And he gathered up all the food of the seven years, which were in the land of Egypt. I think we can assume that during the seven years of plenty, the resident Egyptians ate some food. It is doubtful they could have found a way to save it all. Yet this is a manner of speech that was prevalent at the time. In Hebrew parlance, all and every appears where we might say much, many, or some. In the same story of Joseph, and all countries came into Egypt to Joseph for to buy corn. Genesis 41, 57. That is to say, the nearby countries in the vicinity of Egypt came to buy corn. No one showed up from Peru or China or Madagascar. Today the word totally has found its way into American jargon. Someone might say, for example, I am totally exhausted. 
and we fully realize their state of exhaustion, whatever it may be, falls short of being total. I totally understand that. Awesome. Let's revisit the passage and see how it should be understood. This is Genesis 6, 11, 13, translated in light of what we now know. The land also was corrupt before God, and the land was filled with violence. And God looked upon the land, and behold, it was corrupt. For Adam's generations had corrupted their way upon the land. And God said unto Noah, The end of Adam's generations is come before me. For the land is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the land. Noah begins to take center stage in Genesis 6. Genesis tells us that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, that he was a just man, perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. Josephus echoes that, saying that God loved Noah for his righteousness. The writer of Jubilees confirms that Noah was perfect in his generations by including a little more information. Noah took to himself a wife, and her name was Emzara, the daughter of Rachel, the daughter of his father's brother. And Noah's father's brother would be his uncle, and Emzara would have been his uncle's granddaughter, Noah's first cousin once removed. In fact, the writer of Jubilees diligently recorded the names of all of the wives of all of Adam's descendants from Seth through Noah, including the wives of Noah's three sons. Whereas the writer of Genesis simply summed it all up by telling us Noah was perfect in his generations, the writer of Jubilees provided proof by naming the wives and telling us something about their ancestry until he got to Noah's sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. And here he just listed the names of the three wives without saying anything about where they came from, although their names are of non-Semitic origin, indicating they came from the indigenous population, Sumerian or Ubaidan, if there were any Ubaidans left by the time of the flood. Genesis 6.14 initiates the account of the flooding, beginning with the instruction God gives to Noah to build the ark. Jewish historian Josephus wrote, Accordingly, he entered into the ark and his wife and sons and their wives and put into it not only other provisions to support their wants there, but also sent in with the rest all sorts of living creatures, the male and his female, for the preservation of their kinds, and others of them by sevens. Now this ark had firm walls and a roof, and was braced with cross beams, so that it could not be any way drowned or overborne by the violence of the water. And thus was Noah with his family preserved. A clay tablet recovered from Nippur, biblical Kalna, contained about 300 lines written in Sumerian cuneiform with the first 37 lines missing. The coming of the flood is revealed to Zayasudra by way of a subterfuge. The wise Enki, who was high in the council of the gods, knows the flood is imminent, but was supposed to keep it a secret. Instead, he speaks out to the wall of Zayasudra's hut, with Zayasudra hearing his words. The legend of Atrahasis repeats the same theme. Ea, the Akkadian name for the Sumerian Enki, speaks out. Wall hearken to me. Read hut, guard well all my words. Destroy the house, build a ship, renounce worldly goods, keep the soul alive. Josephus records, now, God loved this man for his righteousness, yet he not only condemned those other men for their wickedness, but determined to destroy the whole race of mankind and to make another race that should be pure from wickedness, and cutting short their lives, and making their years not so many as they formerly lived, 
but 120 only. He turned the dry land into sea, and thus were all these men destroyed, but Noah alone was saved. 